Wafu Bay. This is Misao Bay, aka Warlock Asylum, coming at you once again with another lesson from the Simon Necronomicon. And today we're going to be talking about the walking a little bit further. We're going to be advancing from the previous lesson that we discussed about the zoning. And we're going to get into the book of entrance and the walking. So there's a lot of uh, different points here that are very distinct and uh, very intelligible as far as the operations want to go. So I'm going to share my screen. So we can get right into this. And uh, I think you'll find this a very enjoyable discussion. Okay, so we can see here that we are at the location of the book of entrance and the walking. I'll read the first paragraph and I'll just expand because there's a lot of meat in this discussion. Uh, hopefully, we'll probably come back to it in future episodes, but I just want to touch on a couple of things here. It says, this is the book of interest to the seven zones above the earth, which zones were known to the Chaldeans and to the ancient races that preceded them among the lost temples of Ur. Know that these zones are governed by celestial spirits, and the passage may be had by the priests through those lands that border their own zone waste beyond. So... A lot of times, you know, I mentioned in previous episodes about the netherworld, and it will still apply here because the netherworld, um, as mentioned in Gates of the Necronomicon, can, can refer to the uh, realms that of stars that exist below the horizon and chthonic energies, as we discussed in previous uh, uh, episodes, or it can be in the depths of space, because from the naked eye, the eye of the uninitiated, the depth of space looks like it's lifeless. So in that sense too, it's said to be the underworld. Okay, now common sense would tell a person that it's possible. Let me just stop sharing my screen for one second, just to talk on this a little bit more straight with the audience, that the reason why in the Simon Necronomicon, in a certain section, the introduction, it says that um, Tiamat is associated in one section with the Rishkagal. And that's possibly another name for Rishkagal. And this is for that reason, because if the ancient Sumerians viewed the netherworld, the underworld, as applying to both in certain instances, the chthonic energies in reference to the stars that are below the horizon and out of space, then that means that the ruler of the underworld will govern both of those sections. You see what I'm saying? And so that's why Orishka Gals was related to Tiamat because evidently as, you know, it explains the right uh that you know was was before babylon was built so i'm gonna go back to sharing my screen once that point is made and why you know we understand the chthonic energies is applying to the underworld and as we mentioned the depths of outer space the stars below the horizon were considered like trees that no longer produce fruit you know because their influence has waned upon man because they're not seen in the land of the living and that's how that was viewed so i'm gonna share my screen again and we can continue on to the next few pa paragraph or passages okay and it says um know that when walking through the sea of spheres he should leave his watcher behind that it may guard his body and his property lest he be slain by unawares and must wander throughout all of eternity in the dark spaces between stars, or else be devoured by the wrathful Igigi that dwell beyond. Okay, so there's a lot of talk I had offline about the Watcher and the necessity uh, to call it. Um, what I would say is that 
when we read this passage that one should leave his watcher behind that may guard his body and his property, uh, the property in this case being his sanity, um, his thoughts, his desires. Uh, so this applies directly to the sleep of Ishtar where she left her watcher behind. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll continue on. Know that thou must walk the steps of the ladder of lights, each in this place, one at a time. Okay, so we discussed that in the previous video that walking is similar to what Muslims would call ha, just a form of dedication, to a way of building up the inner astral body and the steps that are taken should be taken in the order that's given. You know, um, I was around at a time where people would just say, hey, I want to get in touch with this energy. Let me walk its gate. But that's not really what's going on when a person does that. That's why the seal of the gate is given so that it can be called just like someone will call one of the 50 names. Um, so it says, and thou must enter by the gates in a lawful manner. So this is what's meant by a lawful manner, to enter the gates in the manner prescribed, right? Uh, as is put down in the covenant, as thou art surely lost, okay? And that really just says that if a person mixes up their walking, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for them to really gain or grapple the affairs of their life. Okay. Know that thou must be uh, kept purified for the space of one moon for entrance to the first step, one moon between the first and the second step, and again in between the first and the third. So there's been like a lot of talk about this man spilling his seed and can he walk and things of that nature. Some people, uh, during male ejaculation, they would just think of Ishtar as a way to get around that, to worship at the temple of Ishtar. But actually, and this is what gets crazy. Let me just pull up my screen for a second so that the understanding can be had. The temple of Ishtar, okay. Let's take this an example. I'm gonna go to another section of the Necronomicon. Uh, because this has to be said here clearly so that people really know what's going on and you know why is this guy making reference to the temple of Ishtar when there's no temple of Ishtar you know what is he talking about and then we know what happened at the temple of Ishtar um, sacred prostitution went on things of that nature okay that sort of thing. Um, okay, so this is what's going on here. I'm gonna share my screen. The temple of Ishtar that the Mad Arab was talking about in the Book of Entrance actually exists in the Book of Calling. Okay, and I'm gonna pull that up for y'all. We're gonna go back to share screen. I just wanna touch on this point because the text, you kind of have to understand other things that are existing in the text to really get a full picture. You, Necronomic is not a book that you could just take one section and pull it out and think you're gonna understand the whole text. So when they're talking about the Temple of Ishtar, historically the Temple of Ishtar is a place where sacred prostitution went on and just a whole bunch of other things that um, dealt with the inauguration of the Babylonian kings, things of that nature. Actually, the 50 names of Marduk came from another story of uh, Ishtar and Tammuz or Anana and Dumuzi, where she made Dumuzi have 50 orgasms. Later on, as things were moving from a matriotic era to a more patriotic era, those 50 orgasms were said to be powers from the heavenly gods that were, that came upon Marduk. But even at the time that that myth was reconstructed in the Enuma Elish, 
the kings of ancient Babylon were still going through a rite where they would sleep with a priest of Ishtar, sometimes in front of a crowd of 300 people in attendance, and she would bring the king through certain tantric rites where he would have an orgasm 50 times, and that's how he knew that he was able to rule as king. On a deeper note, the United States, when it gets to its 50th president, it too will probably reach a place where uh, the political climate and structure will change because each state represents an orgasm. So when the president's anointed, just like it was in ancient Babylon, he's bestowed with 50 orgasms or the the emotional uh, fury of the population that residing in each state blesses the president. And the, in a more psychological way, but in ancient Babylon, it comes from the sexual right. Now, the the fury over politics can be said to be the same energy as sexual energy. But this is the reason why there's 50 stars on the US flag. A lot of people don't know this because the depths of Babylon was not known. So the founding fathers resided more on masonry. But I'll discuss that in another video in depth. But in this section, you can see that this is the temple of Ishtar that the Mad Arab was referring to in the Book of Entrance. It's a threefold step in the temple where it deals with the preliminary purification and vacation, where one will purify themselves just like they're purifying themselves before you know, they would um, lay down with someone in sacred sexual relations. They would take a shower, pamper up, brush their teeth, all sorts of stuff. Then to win the love of a woman, um, this right, you know, is said over apple or pomegranate, and that has its own figurativeness to probably share in the essence of foreplay. Okay, um, apple, which is spelled A P P L E. Uh, let me see how this goes. Uh, a P P L E. That will be sixteen and sixteen, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-three and twelve would be forty-five. Forty-five and five would be fifty. So apple and simple gametria also equals fifty, and so this would definitely deal with foreplay. And then the return to potency would be, you know, the right after the blessing. So to win the love of the woman would be to imbue her with the spirit of Ishtar. This doesn't necessarily mean a literal apple. It just means that a person is imbued with the spirit of Ishtar. But this is the temple of Ishtar. You have to think, why in a book that talks about a necromantic rite, are they going to have three you know, quote unquote spells listed to Ishtar because that's what's talking about the temple of Ishtar. So a person could ejaculate in within the temple, they can lose their seed and it could naturally be with their wife or whatever, but they will have to go through these steps. You know, people um, pray before they eat. Priests and priestesses should actually give the same uh, veneration before they have relations. Okay, so we're going to go back to the uh, reading of the. Hold on a second. Let me just get this straight. So I want to make sure I'm in the right section. I don't want to. Don't want to mix this up. So let me get back to the book of entrance and the walking, as we see. Let me just uh, pull this up and. Uh, we don't have to stop this, bring it back up. Okay, and there we go. We'll look back on share screen. So, <clears throat> okay, so we pass this part of Ishtar, and that's why it says, and this is a great secret, because a lot of people don't know 
some of the things in economic and have a historical value, uh, but they're transliterated in the text and presented in a certain experience. And this is what this experiences relate to. Um, here's another thing that's very important. I'm gonna talk about this after the reading of this passage. Thou must needs call upon thy God in the dawn light and upon thy goddess in the dusk every day of the moon of purification. Thou must summon thy watcher and instruct it perfectly in its duties, providing it with a time and a place whereby it will serve thee with a flaming sword in every direction. Uh, and there's a 50 name that rules over that. I think it's Asura Ludu. So that is to be invoked. Um, it says the clothing for the walking should be appropriate, fair and clean, and thou should have uh, with thee the seal of the particular step upon which thou walkest, which is the steel of the, of the star um, appertaining therein. Okay, so this is what I wanted to touch on. I thought it was early in the verse, but it says, Thou must needs prepare an altar to face the north, having upon it statues of thy deities, or some such suitable images, an offering bowl and a brazier upon the earth should be inscribed, the gate appropriate to thy walking. If above thee is in this, okay. So let, let me just stop right there for a second. Um, as we can see here, it mentions that one is to have upon their altar the statues of thy deities, okay, and suitable images, okay. That is something that, you know, a lot of people are not aware of because we see a distinct difference in a sentence earlier it says to call upon thy God in the morning and thy goddess in the evening. After that, it says that a person should, this is during the, the moon of purification, one is to do these things. So basically thy God will be more duke. So one is to call upon um, the spirits of more duke, the 50 names, and then there, which evidently came from the goddess Ishtar. So it makes sense that Ishtar is called in the evening um, through the preliminary purification ritual. Regardless of one is spilling their seed or not, that rite should be used in the evening, uh, seven, three to seven days before walking consecutively. The 50 names are to be called three to seven days before walking consecutively. Now here's the thing with the 50 names that should be known. Every seven names make a gate. Every seven names make a gate. So with the exception of Mardu. So that's how we know what names to be called seven days prior to walking. So when you look at the first seven names, let's just keep it simple to say the first seven names, I would say Marduk would identify also more as self. But the first seven names of Marduk, I'm not sure what the seventh name is offhand right now, but it will be those first seven names that one will call seven days before going into Nana. That's how that works, very simple. Um, the preliminary purification, of Ishtar is read in the evening before night, okay? I'm gonna share my screen again because I'm gonna point out some other things that could be lost in translation as we're talking. Um, it says that thou must prepare altar to face the north, having upon it statues of thine deities or some subtle images. So these are your own deities. If you're working with Kuan Yin, you're working with Amaterasu, you're working with Santa Marte. These <laughs> energies should be on your altar. It shouldn't be separate from what you're doing. Like the rites themselves may be separate, you know, uh, in their individual worship, but they should be present because they're part of the pantheon that guides you. 
you know what I'm saying? You can, you're allowed to have those images. I think that's more of a personal choice because it says, in awesome, suitable images. But we, but what should be emphasized that this area of lying deities is distinct from calling upon the God and thy goddess. And once again, um, why I'm bringing this up is because most people who work with the Simon Necronomicon have noted that when they're working with the Simon Necronomicon, it increases uh, awareness of energies that they, a person could be working with in other systems. For example, if a person is a Sufi and he may be doing certain exercises, he'll notice that his powers to perceive those energies and communications with those powers increases when he's gatewalking. And to have thy deities and statues of that upon thy altar indicates why that happens, whether it's a physical statue or one that exists in the mind. This is why this increases. Okay, so in getting back to the text, let me pull up uh, a couple of other things. I want to share with you uh, in reference to that God and Goddess, because it, somebody may have missed the episode when I talk about that God and Goddess. We find that information in the um, in the testimony of the Mad Arab. That's how we know who that God and Goddess that the Mad Arab is talking about. That's who we know who they who it is. So I'm going to share my screen once again. And we're going to pull this up to illustrate who is that God and Goddess in Necronomicon. Notice what it says. And it seems very similar to what it says in the Book of Entrance about setting up the altar. It says, I have summoned the ghosts of my ancestors to real and visible appearance on the tops of temples built to reach the stars. That sounds like the book of entrance, doesn't it? And built to touch the nethermost cavities of Hades, because there is a right of going to Ganzia that a person faces in the walking, which is also mentioned in the book of entrance. I have wrestled with the black magician, Azak Thor, in vain, Okay, that's also mentioned in the Book of Walking because it mentions towards the end, uh, uh, sorry, the Book of uh, Entrance. It mentions that when the ceremony is over, that the gatewalker should read of the sleep of Ishtar and how she ascended from the underworld. This whole verse is a reference to the Book of Entrance. Like we said before, the testimony of the mad Arab it is a complete manual of how the rest of the book works. Okay, it's amazing. In vain and fled the earth by calling upon Anana and her brother Marduk, Lord of the Double-Headed Axe. So that tells you right there who the god and goddess of the priests or priestess of the Necronomicon is. It's absolutely fascinating. Some of the information that you can come here, especially when you know how to cross-reference the text. And that's why it's valuable to read the Necronomicon and get very familiar with it, possibly make, you know, a copy of it in your own name and that sort of thing. So we're going to uh, get back to the book of entrance and of the walking. And I'm going to share my screen again. Let me just do that. And here we go. So this is some very valuable information. Okay, it says, upon the earth should be inscribed the gate appropriate to the walking. If above thee is the sky, so much better. If there be a roof above thy head, it must be free from all hangings. Not even a lamp should be suspended over thee, save in the operation of calling, which is discussed elsewhere, if the gods grant me the time. Okay, so the only light should be the four lamps on the ground, each Okay, so this deals with the four gates, and that's something that we'll discuss probably more so when we get to the Book of Calling. Okay, here's the gate representations, which have been discussed in the book Gates of the Necronomicon by Simon. If you don't have it, you should definitely receive it. Um, a lot of times, this gate gets tagged as an inverse of 
the uh, moon pentacle and the uh, grimoire of Solomon, the keys of Solomon. Uh, and that's not exactly true. There's another grimoire that actually renders the gate like this that preceded the Necronomicon by several years. I'll get the name for that for you. I'll probably have it next episode. But um, people like Amadi and, and George Madison kind of make me aware of that. Um, and throughout their research, they discovered such things. Okay, so moving further down, it says, and the ritual of the walking must follow the formula described. First, thou must observe the moon of purification. In this time, thou must not eat meat for the space of seven days. So someone was asking me about eating meat to contact these energies. Okay, so a person shouldn't eat meat for the space of seven days. I think someone had hit me with a comment of that in a recent video. And I told them I don't think that's a good idea during the ceremonies but maybe at other times. But we can see here that the person shouldn't eat meat at the space preceding seven days. And you'll find that this is true even if you're not walking. I'm going to tell you why. The moon is a sacred time once you begin gate walking, period. Whether it's the new moon or the full moon, it becomes a sacred time. Um, a lot of times when my wife is cooking, she'll ask me, like, yo, it's just, you know, like the full moon. You know, when is the full moon coming? Because... I'm not doing any eating of anything. I don't even eat meat, you know, at this point. But the thing about it is, is that, you know, when you look in history, like with the ancient Greeks and Romans, they wouldn't eat meat before court decisions because they felt it would affect their process. The reason why meat is not eaten, some of it is health, but a lot of it has to do with the body's energy. The body, like, I think, approximately nearly 70%, over 70% of its energy is utilized just in the digestion of food. The body's energy is just utilized, over 70% of it, 75% is used in the digestion of food. So meat takes quite a bit of time to digest different than other things that are taken into the body. So you don't want the body's energy to be depleted in another operation and it allows your awareness and heightened ability so that you can receive the message that you need to receive and that's why that occurs um continuing on preceding the last day of the moon for the space of three days preceding the last day of the moon thou mayest not eat anything whatsoever save to drink sweet water on the last three days, thou may invoke, in addition to thy god and goddess, the three great elder ones, Inki, Enlil, Anu, Enlil, and Inki, by their proper invocations. And the number of Anu is 60, for he is the father of the heavens. The number of Enlil is 50, for, uh, he is the father of the wind. And the number of Inki is 40, the most excellent number. And he is our father of laws who tread these forgotten paths. So Inki is the father, okay? Second on the night of the walking, it must be the 13th of the moon, having begun on the previous 13th night, thou must approach the gate with all respect, the temple exercise, thou must light the fire and conjure it, but the invocation of the god of fire with pour incense thereupon, and thou make offerings to the deities on the altar, okay. Um, now, usually when someone walks a gate, I remember from my day, they will call the fire god and they'll go straight into the watcher. But this is saying that, that the person should make offerings to the deities on the altar after the fire god is called, okay. Um, Thou must light, and that's for a respect thing. It's not so much crossing the current, it is the respect value. Um, usually, even in prayers, people would pray uh, in a series of all the deities that they're engaged with, okay? So that's more of a respect thing. Um, I would say it's a little bit more of a personal thing 
to put certain energies on the altar, but this is what the instructions are. Uh, third, thou must light the four lamps of the brazier, reciting the proper uh, invocation proper to each of the what of these watchtowers in its proper place, summoning the respective star. Four, thou must recite the invocation of the watcher, thrashing the sword into the earth and its station, not touching it until it is appointed time for its departure. Now, this is something that was discussed recently in off chats about, there's a new book out called The Transfiguration of Holy Anana. This book uh, was, was created to I wouldn't say replaced, but it's a new edition of the Oracle of Enhedwana with double the pages, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, if you like the Oracle of Enhedwana, this is a book that you may want to obtain because all the information that's in the Oracle of Enhedwana is in this new text, but a lot more information, a lot of diagrams, there's a lot of stuff in this new text that you may want to get and eventually after Hallow's Eve, the Oracle of Enhedwana, I don't know if that will be available anymore, okay? So why I'm saying this is because in the Transfiguration of Holy Anana, it's, it's literally completely Sumerian, uh, except for some of the diagrams, of course, are interesting, it's very beautiful. Uh, but I would say that it's not the same calling for watchers that it appears in the Simon Economica. Okay, here's the thing with all of this. A person, if they're experienced with an Economica, you know, the Mad Ab says, take what is here and discover the rest. They can improvise on certain rituals, but I would advise that they're consistent with certain mythologies, even the mythology of the Mad Arab would count at this point. However, one thing to keep in mind that is if a person is walking, they will want to use the technology as it's written in Necronomica. They can also improvise a little bit on that, but they want to be consistent with it. So I would think that the walking, if they're going to call the watcher, it would be a how the watcher is called in the Necronomica. Okay? And, and, and that's how that is dealt with. So let's continue on. Um, fifth, thou must take the seal of the star in thy right hand and whisper its name softly upon it. So you should have received the name at the first gate and you can utilize that name to get to the second gate. From the second gate, you should receive a name and that name, and that, if I'm not mistaken, in the gates of Necronomicon, these names that are received should match up with the 50 names. Okay. Um, six, thou must recite the incantation of walking uh, loudly in a clear voice, so thou walk about the gates in a circular fashion, beginning north, walking to the east, southwest, so it's in a, in sort of like a clockwise fashion. Um, seventh thou must arrive back at the gate before that altar and must fall to the ground and they will meet the spirit messenger and they will get a name which can come as a thought or can come as actually an apparition or a vision or what have you. Okay, and it gets into certain instructions that when the first gate has been entered and the name received, thou will fall back to earth and thy temple, that which has been moving about the gate on the ground will have gone. Recite thy thanksgiving to the gods upon thy altar. Strike the sword of a water that it may depart is a very important step. And give the incantation of Anana, which say how she conquered the realm of the underworld and banished Cthulhu and all Eden will vanish thereby, and that will be thus free to depart the gate and extinguish the fire. So that has to be said because whether a person is going into the heavens, which the ancient Sumerians consider the underworld, or if they're going into Ganzir, 
you know, they should read this passage. Okay. Uh, this will not give power over the, the absolute. This power is obtained differently by the ritual of descent. This ritual thou will undertake in the 15th day after the 13th of the moon, which represents the 28th day or the new moon. When thou hast summoned the gate of Marduk to open for Marduk slew the fiends and the nana, a goddess of the 15, conquered the netherworld. Okay. So there's a lot of meat in there because I think when a person builds up to that point, they'll be ready to enter that gate of Ganzia. Um, so it continues on with instructions and there's some points here that we went over about the signs of the horn one and the mad god and that sort of thing. Um, and also gives some instructions here about walking amongst the Igigi, which we'll discuss a little bit later in a future episode. Um, and I want to get down here to the last two paragraphs. And it says, and there are all the Alu frightening dog-faced demons that are messengers of the gods of prey and they chew on the bones of man, and they are many another of which it is not right for place wherein they may be mentioned. Okay, so one thing I want to discuss is that the mad Arab brings up a very good spiritual point when he's talking. And this is why sometimes, even for myself, I would shy away from social media and certain conversations, but it should be a lesson to all and it should be respected by all. When the person is dealing with various forms of spirituality, sometimes they have to keep their mind so focused on what they're dealing with that they can't even speak about other things because it will contaminate the spiritual workings that they are undergoing. So a lot of times when you read the Simon Necronomicon and he says it's forbidden to speak about that here, things of that nature, what he's saying is that you don't want to go into even the right thinking about other energies in the text or other systems, period. You don't want to enter, you don't want to bring those two things together because the more you walk, the more you begin to understand that the process is very mental, um, very, um, very supernatural, but also very mental. And so how you think when he talks about the neighborhoods and all this kind of stuff in the testimonies, he's talking about various regions of the mind in, on occasion. But also in this case, when he's talking about he can't speak upon things here, he doesn't want to contaminate the text by putting a thought in the person's mind that will corrupt or poison the information. Uh, like my mentor used to say, you know, water is good for you, but how good for you it is if you have a little poison into it. No one's going to drink water that has a little poison in it. So you always want to be respectful of what other people are dealing with. They may not want to talk about certain aspects of the economic, you know what I'm saying? First of all, they may not want to talk about it because sometimes there's this idea of, hey, let's get together and talk about all of this. And if it's agreed upon, that's fine. But you should first find agreement with the individual that you're talking about, um, just purely out of respect because um, it can contaminate their minds. I'll give you an example. Um, the Urilatex, right? A lot of people like the Urilatex. Um, and the formula for the Urilatex purely came out of things we were doing about a decade ago. But I'm the only person I know that work with the Urilatex in the sense of initiatory practice and then people came later after that, after getting this formula. Okay. Uh, one thing I would say is that the Eurilitex is not something that really introduced people to. When I got into the Eurilitex, um, 
Inky had mentioned to me, because a lot of times as you're working through the text, you get to know the spirits, just even on the vibration of the thoughts that you receive. So this came sort of like that. When I got into it, it was a distinct energy that was very crisp, and it was very much in tune with nature, as you can see from its own call. And what was told to me was that this is not for everybody who's in the system of walking. It's only for people who are invited into that work. So the idea of like, you know, someone walking and stuff and introducing them to certain things, you know, that's, it's kind of interesting because that's sort of like the depths of that secret society. You see what I'm saying? Other aspects of the information is very similar and can be found in other locations. But the jargon of the Arilla text, it's not really even a path in, in, in the true essence. You know, it's part of the same whole. However, it's, it's definitely a place that there is a hidden science in, and the hidden science shouldn't be revealed. On the other side of the coin, I'm gonna reflect on something uh, of a myth to kind of help bring this point home. That's one side of the coin. Now, what happens if a person invites someone into the little working who may not be eligible for it? Well, as we know, the Simon Economican has stories of deities that are in Sumeria and outside. Someone bring up an outside story about Izanagi no Mikoto, a Shinto energy who went to the underworld to rescue his wife in the same manner that Inki went to rescue a rich gal from Kerr. So in the process of that, when Izanagi came out of Yomi, which is the equivalent of the underworld, he said that as having touched the underworld, he may have bad luck. So he went through a process of purification and through that process was produced the moon god and Amaterasu Surukami. Not to digress too much, but the idea that I want to say is that if a person touches the depths of the underworld, and don't really have an understanding of what they're doing, they could spew on quite a bit of bad luck if they're not invited. That's just one example because they wouldn't know that they would have to clean themselves when they come out, you see what I'm saying? And so, you know, it's just kind of interesting. I just wanted to touch on that, but I'm gonna go move on into further into the text so that we can get, you know, some, some, some deeper understandings of what's going on here at the bottom, and it says, um, uh, okay, and the chew on the very bones of man, this is the paragraph that begins in there, all, all I lose, frightening, I might as well just read it, dog-faced demons are the messengers of the gods of prey, and that chew on the very bones of man, and they are many of which it is not the rightful place wherein they may be mentioned, save to warn the priests against ambitious strivings against the ancient ones of outside, until masteries require over the powers that reside within. Okay, that's a very important thing because really, um, you know, there are various ways that the text can be worked with. And the matter I mentions that here, but he mentions that first a person will want to master the powers within. They want to master the inner self because once you start going against the grain of something that we just discussed, you could be igniting certain things within you that you might not be able to control. And it doesn't necessarily lead to a horrific outcome, but maybe something that you just didn't want to see in your life. Uh, may appear, the things that you may have to deal with, some of the fears you may have to encounter in a much more intense level. And so this is what the Mad app is saying in these passages. Uh, Until masteries acquire over the powers within, only when a door has been obtained may the priest consider himself a master over the spheres and able to wrestle with the old gods. Once death herself has been stared in the eye, 
can the priest then summon and control the dozens of death's darkly curtained halls? That, that whole sentence is a right in itself that I will explore in a future episode. Then can he hope to open the gate without fear and without the loathing of the spirit that slays the man? Okay, so sometimes there's this fear of opening the gate because you don't know what you're getting into. You don't know how to get stuff out of the gate if you open it. You know, you're just doing this stuff. Hopefully it makes you feel good or you can get something something done, uh, some sort of request done or whatever. But I think I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is make a whole episode behind this passage because in the last sentence, not the last sentence, but the last sentence of this paragraph, when it says, once death herself has been stared in the eye, can the priest then summon and control the designants of death's darkly curtain halls? That's a whole lesson right there in itself. So, you know what? I'm going to go over that at a different time, probably when we get to the Book of Calling. I'll go to the last two sentences, the last two sections. It says, then can he hope to have power over the demons that plague the mind and the body, pulling at their hand, grasping at their hands, and the screaming vile names into the airs of the night. And what that means is it's talking about the worries, because you start seeing when you gate walk that, let me stop sharing the screen for a second, that these energies, the energies of a lot of your thoughts and desires act on their own accord. And this is what he's talking about you know the demons that pull up the head they're demons but they manifest as thoughts some can manifest physically you know like in people you can kind of see certain things but a lot of times they manifest as thoughts and desires but they're not your own but you could deceive yourself by thinking that they are you know you feel that this is some you born you and it's just taking you for a long ride okay so i just want to cover that and um, let me share my screen again. And hit the last sentence. For what comes on the wind can only be slain by he who knows the wind. And what comes by the seas can only be slain by he who knows the waters. And right there, he's talking about the cults of Inki, which it says in the beginning is the god of the wind. And uh, I'm sorry, Enlil and Enki, which is the god of the seas. So he's saying once you know those things, you can kind of know the energies, you know, the, the shadow sides of these energies and how they work. Um, this is written in the ancient covenant. And so this will conclude our discussion for the Book of Interest and of the Walking. Um, I hope you found it beneficial, and if you have any questions or comments or concerns, please list them below in the comment section. And uh, we'll be back shortly with another lesson from the Simon Necronomicon. All right, have a good night.